responsibility. Incredibly damaging messages being sent to the rest of the world about how democracy functions. And I think it is uh, um, Well, I don't know his motive, but I, I just think it's totally irresponsible. Are you concerned he may succeed, that people may question the legitimacy of your administration? No, I'm not concerned the vast majority of the American people. They've already, all the polling data has indicated, although the Republicans who worry about it is higher, but the over 78 percent of the American people believe it's, without question, it's legitimate. Um, and uh, I, I just think it's, uh, and I think most of the Republicans I've spoken to, including some of the governors, I think this is debilitating. It's not a, it sends a horrible message about who we are as a country. Hi again, everyone. It's five o'clock in the East. That was President-elect Joe Biden just in the last hour with harsh words for the man he will replace on January 20th. Donald Trump has been going to the mattresses to try to delegitimize Joe Biden's victory, trying to undermine a Biden presidency with a gang of accomplices who are pressing local officials, filing baseless lawsuits and sowing distrust of an election that was deemed the, quote, most secure in U.S. history. Washington Post reporting today, quote, President Trump called a GOP canvassing board member in Wayne County who announced Wednesday she wanted to rescind her decision to certify the results of the presidential election. The member said in a message to the Washington Post Thursday, I did receive a call from President Trump late Tuesday evening after the meeting. Monica Palmer, one of the two Republican members of the four member Wayne County canvassing board, told the Post, asked if they discussed the presidential vote count, she said, Quote, it's hard for me to describe. There was a lot of adrenaline and stress going on. There were general comments about different states, but we really didn't discuss the details of the certification. And we're learning today that Trump is going even further than that in his quest to overturn the results in Michigan, a state Joe Biden won by more than 150,000 votes. New York Times adds this reporting, quote, after failing repeatedly in court to overturn election results, President Trump is taking the extraordinary step of reaching out directly to Republican state legislators as he tries to subvert the electoral college process, inviting Michigan lawmakers to meet with him at the White House on Friday, which goes right in line with reporting from the Washington Post that the Trump team's efforts are more focused on sowing chaos around the certification process than actually prevailing in any of those legal challenges. Quote, Giuliani has also told Trump and associates that his ambition is to pressure GOP lawmakers and officials across the political map to stall the vote certification in an effort to have Republican lawmakers pick electors and disrupt the Electoral College when it convenes next month. And Trump is encouraging of that plan, according to two senior Republicans who have conferred with Giuliani and spoke on the con spoken anonymously. But that outcome appears impossible. It is against the law in Pennsylvania. Wisconsin law gives no role to the legislature in choosing presidential electors, and there is little public will in any other states to pursue such a path. Quick reminder, Rudy Giuliani, now at the helm of Donald Trump's election delegitimization effort, was singled out by U.S. intelligence agencies last year as the target of a likely Russian disinformation effort. And earlier today, he held a wild news conference filled with falsehoods on voter fraud, even claiming that the fraud was nationally coordinated as hair dye ran down his face. A president and his cronies trying to steal an election is where we start this hour with some of our most favorite reporters in France. John Heilman's back, NBC News and MSNBC national affairs analyst, executive editor of The Recount, and the host of the Hell and High Water podcast. Also joining us, Jason Johnson, politics and journalism professor at Morgan State University, an MSNBC and GRIO contributor, and Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and MSNBC legal analyst. Um, Andrew Weissman, I want to start with you. Is this a thing? I mean, can you... We know they're not competent to execute it, but were they? Is this possible? I think, practically speaking, it's not possible. Um, first, with respect to what they're doing in the courts, it's really not a legal strategy. It's a political strategy. Um, the court cases are... Uh, all being thrown out or being withdrawn. It is one of the guardrails that's actually still functioning. Um, and, you know, in courts, you need facts and you need the law. 
and they have neither. Um, so you're seeing all of that being thrown out, which is why I think you're seeing plan B, which is to go directly uh, to the legislatures. But you know, there's a problem here, which is that if they're not careful, um, what they're doing can violate both federal and state law, which is you cannot tamper with um, valid election results. Um, and you know, this is a place where um, they may be hoisted by their own petard because the attorney general issued a memo saying that, you know what, we're going to be able to go in and fix things now. The normal process was to wait until the election's over. Well, where's the attorney general now if for people who are going yeah. in, like Lindsey Graham and others who are going to be trying to tamper with officials? Um, so this is where you know they have to worry because obviously Attorney General Barr is not going to do that. But there is soon going to be a change in administration. So their representations will come with what they do in, in the various states is, is going to be quite risky. I mean, it's such a sad commentary that, that you even have to utter. Obviously, Barr won't do that. I mean, are you saying, though, that, that there are possible violations of the law in Lindsey Graham's um, calls to the Georgia Secretary of State and other efforts to intimidate or otherwise influence what electors do? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, the facts matter. Um, it'll be important to know exactly what happened in that conversation. But there are federal laws that prohibit, um, for instance, falsely certifying an election or tampering with an election. And there's state laws. So you have both uh, the future attorney general and you have um, local uh, attorneys general um, who can be looking at this issue. And so if Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and others are going to be uh, trying to strong arm people, um, those kinds of representations are not just holding a press conference where there's no, they don't have to worry about legality. They can say whatever they want. But if they're going to take this into discussions to try to get people to certify falsely um, election results um, to get to change the will of the people, um, they really do have to worry about crossing a legal line. And as I said, this is an area where, you know, the courts are a guardrail that's actually holding up. Um, and frankly, we're seeing that even with um, Republican uh, state officials who are not willing to break the law and are going to uphold democracy. But Nicole, as you said, it, it's such a sad state that we're even having this discussion because, you know, just a short time ago, this would be unimaginable to be having a conversation on air about this happening in America. Yeah, I mean, and, and we've been talking all afternoon about how the Republicans are, are doing just puts them right in as part of this conspiracy to delegitimize um, what Chris Krebs, who was fired for doing such a good job protecting the election from foreign interference and widespread fraud, called the most secure election in our country's history. Um, John Hyland, I want to ask you about two interviews that you've done. I know you interviewed Steve Bannon. I don't know if it was before or after he was indicted. Um, but I know you have him on tape talking about how this was the strategy all along. But you also interviewed Bob Bauer, who had this legal strategy in place. They felt incredibly uh, confident. They were on the offense. But I, I wonder if they were as prepared for what this turned out to be, which is, as Andrew Weissman just said, a political and PR operation um, with no chance of overturning the election, but perhaps delaying um, some of these certifications if they should prevail in any of these states. And it would appear making great inroads at delegitimizing Joe Biden's win. Yeah. Hi, Nicole. Um, good to see you, as always. Um, Hi. Those interviews were both, um, those interviews both took place uh, that you're talking about, both took place in October, long after Steve Bannon had been, uh, had been indicted, but while he was out on bail. There was actually, we talked on the night of the first debate. Um, and I talked to Bob after that, uh, Bob Bauer after that. And I think it is sort of stunning. Um, this strategy that Rudy Giuliani is pursuing right now with the president's assent and with 
and with really Steve Bannon as kind of the mastermind of it is something that Giuliani and Bannon started cooking up in October. A lot of things happened, obviously, in this election year. We've sort of forgotten some of them. One that you, I know, will remember is Bart Gelman wrote this story in The Atlantic um, that caused, in early October, maybe late September, caused the people to sort of look up and say, wait a minute, how does this Electoral College thing work? And it was the beginnings of mm -hmm. the first time, really, in the public conversation, the notion that there's this fragility in our system uh, that it relies on concession. It has historically relied on concession on the part of someone at some point, usually right after the election. Sometimes it takes longer in the case of Al Gore and, and your former boss. Someone's standing up and saying, okay, we fought the good fight, the people have spoken, and now I concede. What happens if you don't have a concession and suddenly the Electoral College, which has been a, which is normally a formality in our system, uh, a perfunctory thing, but now it becomes an arena of contest. That was what Giuliani and, and Bannon started to cook up in that time frame, and Steve Bannon was very open about talking about it with me on camera at the time. What he was not as open about uh, was the reality, which was that the, his, his, his public posture was, we're not going to let the left steal this election. There's going to be all these, these fake votes and, and naked ballots, and we're going to go and fight in every counting room, and that's what this battle's going to be, but eventually we're going to take it to the Electoral College. What reality was, was that this was a naked power play in, in behind the scenes. What they were saying was, we don't really think the left is stealing this election at all, but we think we have power in state legislatures, in the courts, with uh, the, the controlling the, the delegations at the, at the House level, that there was a way in which by exercising a naked power play, not a legal strategy, as Andrew just said, not a legal strategy, a political strategy, and one based mm -hmm. on the raw exercise of power, that if they could delay this thing long enough, look at December 8th when the safe harbor kicks in on the Electoral College, try to get some of these certifications in some key states knocked out, then get some faithless electors, get some state legislatures to get involved in that, that there was a, a way to really just outright steal the election. And they were very blatant in my mind about it. And it was very clear, as is often the case in Trump world, they tell you what they're going to do before they do it. The problem for them, and this is the last thing I'll say, and we can talk about the Bob Bauer thing later, I think there are profound concerns given the number of people out there in America right now who are going to finish this period one way or the other thinking that this was a coup, thinking this was an illegitimate election. But the big problem for the Bannon Rudy, Rudy strategy is that it relied on the notion of a very close outcome. Their thought was if, if Trump loses the way that, that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, in a few key states by very slender margins, you could create this chaos and you might be able to, 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 to re exercising the power the kind of raw power they thought they had, they might be able to throw the Electoral College into chaos. The problem is that that's not what they got. They're, they're running a play for a different game. This was not a close election. And so you look at the places where they're trying to run these plays, Biden's won by such large margins. And they're not epic huge margins, not landslide margins, but they're not a couple thousand votes here or there. And that has taken away a lot of the political traction even with Republicans that they hope to capitalize on in this period, they just don't have the, they just can't get the, anybody to take them seriously right now because the election was too decisive and too obviously the case that Joe Biden has won this election the people have spoken, makes it very hard for them to run this kind of nefarious game plan that they had in mind. You know, um, Jason Johnson, I think the die running down Rudy's face made it difficult to take him seriously. But you've got Steve Bannon, who's been <laughs> indicted, Rudy Giuliani, who's um, r reported by The Washington Post to have been the target of a Russian disinformation campaign and has plenty of uh, rumors swirling around him about criminal investigations. And Donald Trump, who's already been named individual number one in an investigation of the Southern District of New York. You can imagine between the three of them Googling, you know, what does a presidential pardon get you? But the three men, despite being low lowlifes, all three of them, have done, I think, irreparable harm to the democracy and to the beginning, at least, of Joe Biden's presidency. How does Joe Biden get that back? Joe Biden is going to have to do something that we probably haven't seen a president do since maybe the 1920s, after teapot dome scandals and all sorts of issues like that. He, in addition to juggling COVID and figuring out the economy, is going to have to push for a wholesale constitutional structural reform in the United States of America. This may be a bigger task than he is up for. This may be a bigger task than he expected. But Nicole, I have been saying this all throughout this campaign. Donald Trump showed America and the world that our Constitution is not worth the paper it's written on. 
It really is only a gentleman's agreement between really, really rich gentlemen. And if those gentlemen decide that they're going to be rogues and they're going to be bandits, then none of this stuff counts. We are hanging by a thread. Now, that thread happens to be a lot of people who've decided, look, I'm just going to follow the facts. I'm going to follow the rules. It seems pretty obvious that this guy won. But that's not a safe way to keep your democracy functioning. In fact, these court rulings, to me, don't say that the guardrails are working. It means that we are pushing the envelope of how this place functions. A couple of more people here, a few scared legislators there, a couple of judges who don't care about their reputations or having a bad name in history, and you could see a state flip. If you didn't have Democratic governors coming mm -hmm. in and passing laws to say, hey, you can't have faithless electors, this thing could be done. The only reason that we can have discussions about Joe Biden right now is because the autocrat in the office was too too incompetent to pull off this coup. So Joe Biden needs to look through the Constitution and voting laws and push for structural changes that will prevent things like this from happening again. We can't have these kinds of delays when a country is at risk. Andrew Weissman, there's a sort of simmering, um, I would call them like, I'm from California, so I think of fights in terms of tectonic plates pressing against each other that sort of burst and, and create a lot of um, damage when they do. But that kind of pressure is building between folks who think that Donald Trump um, should not be uh, someone who is above the law, that he should be held accountable for either the conduct described in the Mueller report, which you were a part of, um, or that investigation that I referenced out of SDNY, where he was individual number one in a uh, campaign finance uh, scheme um, or, or, or whatever else. Where do you come down on whether this president should be investigated and or prosecuted if the evidence takes us there? So I have uh, really strong views on this. Um, and I know that politically there are those people who say we want to look forward and not backwards. But uh, and leaving aside whether I, that even politically would work, um, I think this is a question about the rule of law. Um, and I think there's sort of two buckets. One is um, if the president committed crimes prior to his uh, becoming president. So if it's shown in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that he committed tens of millions of dollars in tax fraud or bank fraud, then anyone else would be prosecuted. And it really can't be the case that just because you become president, it somehow wiped the slate clean like a giant etch-a-sketch. And it's like you didn't do those crimes uh, prior to entering into office. But I think more than that, I think let's leave that aside. If you obstruct a serious special counsel investigation and you are not held to account for doing that, then what is the point of ever having a special counsel or independent counsel? In other words, if there are no sanctions for doing that and there, it's not a criminal violation and you're not going to uphold that, then you really are saying that the president de facto is above the law. There's, there's no point in ever appointing another special counsel to look into executive branch misconduct because you basically are giving license to that kind of obstruction. And I think we can all look at volume two of this of Mueller report, which is about the president's obstruction, and there is ample evidence to support an indictment in that case. Andrew Weissman, I've wanted to ask you that question for days. Thank you for answering it. John Heilman, thank you, my friend. Thanks for starting us off this hour. Jason's sticking around. When we come back, former President Barack Obama in a new interview that airs tonight right here on MSNBC says he's troubled about what Donald Trump is doing. And all Americans should be too. We'll have that next. Plus, the recount is over in the Georgia presidential race.